I'm excited because it's Father's Day weekend. How many of you guys are dads? Raise your hand. Or granddads. Let's have them stand and give them a big applause. Let's give them a big applause. The men, the godly men who are at church saying, if I could be anybody, any place, I want to be in the house of the Lord. These are the guys. All those clowns that are camping instead, they can fend for themselves. Great to have you guys here. God bless you. Thanks for sharing Father's Day weekend with us. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. I'm excited about it. As you know, I like to talk about on Mother's Day how to honor the women and on Father's Day how to honor the men. That's been my tradition for probably of the 32 years I've been here, 37 years. I can't even remember how many years I've been here. That's mainly what I've done, but today's a little different. Today is a little different in that it is a public confession. Does that sound good? My greatest mistakes as a dad. That's the title of my message. You guys fired up? Take copious notes. You say, why in the world would you want to do that on Father's Day? A, because I'm confident in my manhood and my, my identity in Christ. But more importantly, here's why. I've made plenty of mistakes as a father. None of us do it perfectly, okay? And just because I'm listing these five doesn't mean I have a whole lot more I could possibly list. Amen? <laughs> Secondly, I have actually done some things right. Just because you do some things wrong doesn't mean everything you do is bad. You understand that? Kind of different from the way most young people view our nation. They think we had to, did a few things wrong, so everything's bad. That's not the case. You want the good stuff to outshine the bad stuff. And I think that's true, but that's not the point of my message to how the great things I did as a father. Would you like that title better? <laughs> that seems a little much. Seems like a little much, right? And third thing, the point of today's message then is for me to share my mistakes in hopes that you can learn from my mistakes and be able to make the adjustments before they became, cat could become uh, catastrophic or you would hand off those mistakes to your children for them to repeat in their future generations. And then finally, if you are presently making any of these mistakes or things similar to them, hopefully my suggested solutions will be helpful to you. All of these things will be rooted in God's word with some practical application of how we can live that out in the culture today. Sound good? Well, then let's do the most important thing. Ask God for his help. And then we'll get into the details of the message. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. You are our Father who art in heaven. You are a perfect Father. And we come to you recognizing that apart from you, that we can do nothing of spiritual value or merit. We certainly can't father well, and we, I can't give a sermon well. And so, Lord, we come to you asking for your help, that you would open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to the understanding of your word and how it could apply to our life individually, and especially the men, how we could apply these things to be more effective fathers in our homes and to our children and grandchildren. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's look at my first big mistake, and that is I was inconsistent in my discipline. Now, my children aren't in this service. They're in who knows which ones they're coming to. But uh, they're saying, he's plenty consistent. And I will say, no, I wasn't plenty consistent. I was too inconsistent in my opinion. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 12, where God talks about the importance of discipline. As a father, he says this, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? So I want you to catch something right here in that first line. There's a real pet peeve of mine. God is a father who has children. Everyone can say amen to that? Have any of his kids gone a prodigal way? <laughs> yes, they have. So even a perfect father doesn't have perfect kids. Never judge a father or a mother on the behavior of their children. Otherwise, God failed as a father. Oh, yes. We're going to find out this is one of the laws of fathering that get overlooked. But that's just a little comment to get you juiced up for the rest of this. So God said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And what is discipline? It is measured pain for the purpose of transforming behaviors and developing better habits. Another way of saying it is discipline is or training or discipline is to train a child to be able to inflict small levels of pain in their own life in order to make changes in their direction going forward that's called self-discipline so the role of the dad and the mom but primarily the dad is being addressed here is to teach them through small measured calculated and and, and intentional acts of pain to train them how to take pain and inject it in their own life so that they can make adjustments going forward. 
Is that making sense? That's the purpose of discipline. So if you slap them on the hand because the burner is hot, it's a little bit of pain, they're going to learn from that, right? But they also learn, more importantly, how to control themselves. They learn how to discipline themselves so that by doing small, measured, intentional, targeted pain, they'll avoid greater catastrophic pain in the future or they'll be able to build something better by denying my gratitude immediately in order to put off a greater gratitude in the future or gratification, excuse me, a greater gratification in the future. That's the idea that's behind discipline. So you don't take it lightly. Discipline's a good thing. We need discipline. We need discipline in our study habits. We need discipline in our prayer habits. We need discipline in our, how we love those in our life habits. We need discipline in our eating habits. We need discipline in our physical fitness habits. We need discipline everywhere. Discipline is not bad. Discipline is good. Let's say that together. Discipline is good. good. Say it again. Discipline is good. good. Now sell that to your kid. <laughs> So look at what he says. He says, and don't give up when he corrects you. The purpose of discipline is correction, right? You're going to change the direction where you're going. Verse 6, for the Lord disciplines those he what? Well, let's say it together. Loves. If you don't discipline your kid, you don't love them. There it is. There it is. The Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. He doesn't discipline the neighbor's kids because they aren't his kids. He lets them what? He lets them go their own way until they're ready to repent and come to him. That's why it says in Romans chapter 1, for those who rejected God, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. It means he gave them up. He gave them up to their own desires, their own plans, their own will, their own, their own, their own agenda. And that's a self-punishing so that that pain will bring them back to God. But God doesn't discipline the non-believer. So many times Christians get upset because they go, you know, I'm trying to do everything right and my life is really hard. And then my non-Christian friend, and everything works out for him. Yeah, because he's not God's child. You look at the end of his road, it's called what? Eternal damnation, not a good end. You should be praying for that guy. Anyways, let's continue. We're getting off, off track a little bit, right? Verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. It's a blessing. You're part of his family. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? I actually could name some people. <laughs> and so could you. That is not a statement of something good. Responsible fathers discipline their children. It's interesting that throughout the Bible, the father is chiefly the one that is responsible for the discipline. Verse 8, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. You just had a psychological conversion or a cultural conversion. You haven't had a spiritual transformation. You haven't been born again into the family of God. That's what he's saying, right? Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, my kid never respects me. Let me ask you, do you discipline him? See, what you discipline gets respected. My dog was laying in the way of the other dog because she likes to dominate her older sister. And so the older sister was moaning because she wanted to move through the passageway to get back into the house, and the little one wasn't going to let her. She just gave her the look. And so the older dog is kind of whining like, hey, Daddy, help me. Arr, arr, arr. So I walked over, and I said to the little one, Hey, you need to get out of the way. Zin, move over. Zin sounds like sin. There's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> and she just gave me the look. And so I grabbed her by the scruff of her neck, and she went, Arr. And I said, Boom, boom. I am the boss. And she went, Arr. I dropped her on the couch nicely. She, she looks over, she starts wagging her tail. Like, Am I okay? I'm okay. Yeah, you're okay, but you can't behave disrespectfully. Suddenly the dog's attitude changed. No more hassling big sister. No more growling at Pastor Kent because he's the big dog. You get respect by discipline, right? Now, you don't discipline a child like you do a dog, so don't take it that way for those who want to take it out of context. But you have to discipline. My point is, if you want to be respected as a father, you must discipline your children. Shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they know how. Who can say amen to that? We did pretty much the best we knew how. We gave it our best shot, most of us anyways. But God's discipline is always, what's that word? Good. 
It's always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. The word means righteousness, that we might take on the character of God. We need to be trained in our behavior to become more like God. It doesn't just magically happen, and it doesn't happen through prayer only. You should pray and discipline your children. Okay? Verse 11. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Ask your kid. Hey, you enjoying this? They're going to think you're psychotic. It's painful. And the truth is, it's also painful to the parent. Now, it's not more painful to the parent than the child. That's a lie. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. No, it's not. That's not the goal. We'll both get hurt, but we're going to do this. Right? It's painful. But afterwards, delayed gratification, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So discipline is for the purpose of training our children in holy habits that produce Christ-like character. It will be painful for them, uncomfortable for us, but it is our responsibility to do that. If we're consistent in doing that, we will be respected by our children. That's the whole idea. So here's the note. It's very difficult to be consistent in discipline. Now, in all honesty, let's have a moment of honesty. How many of your fathers could say, I could have been more consistent in my discipline? Sure. Yeah. It's hard. Now, why is it so hard? Because it is unpleasant both for dad and the child. As a result, laziness or the desire to avoid conflict or the desire to be liked in the moment are great hazards to consistent discipline. Those are great hazards. Now, I know that when I was inconsistent in discipline, I was just, in my, this is my rationalization, it's a sin, it's a sinful rationalization, I'm going to put that up front, I was just too tired. Well, I'm just, well, oh man, I've got to do this again, I mean, it's like the 10,000th time we've done this. You, get, you kind of feel that way, don't you? And you go, oh man, again? And then you kind of lean on mom, and it's really not her job, you kind of give her, you know, your kid's acting out of control. <laughs> you know how you say that, your kid, Right? And this is why, you're, you're, but these are all excuses. There is no legitimate excuse because in that moment you're saying my comfort, my peace, my, my wanting to be refreshed at this moment is more important than the character development of this child. And that's the shortcoming. That's our sin that we have to face. That's the sin I have to face in my track record as a parent. And Ephesians 6, 4 says this. Again, it's amazing how it always points to the dad first as the disciplinarian in the home. Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. What do you mean? Rather, so he's combining this idea into a compound idea. So don't separate the rather from the first half. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. In other words, a father can cause and provoke a child to anger by the way he disciplines them. Even though discipline comes from God. In other words, what God wants us to do is dads. But we can provoke them to anger. Another translation says exasperate them. In other words, make them feel like there's no way they can win. Or that the motive of the discipline isn't their good. It is a relief of your own anger and frustration. These things provoke the child to deep anger towards dad. Now here's the point. The purpose of discipline is to teach a child how to live a righteous and peaceful life by practicing self-control, self-discipline, so that they can develop constructive, healthy habits. When we discipline in anger, we communicate to the child that we are out of control by our own undisciplined emotions. We're trying to say, you have to have good Christ-like character, and you're yelling at him. Well, that actually doesn't match the message. And this is part of the confusion or exasperation or what causes anger in a child, right? Right? It's a self-contradictory message that frustrates, angers, provokes a child. Proper discipline, and here's the key, requires consistent self-control in our attitude, in our tone, and in the execution, in the training of our child. So what do we do? We develop a constructive outlet for our frustration-based anger before you discipline or instruct your child. Now, the way I came to this realization is that we were in a family counseling situation, and in the midst of the family counseling situation, one of my kids said, Dad yells at us! And I looked at the counselor like, yeah, doesn't every dad yell? 
I mean, every dad I know yells. I grew up in a family of eight kids, and my dad yelled at all of us. And the counselor said, well, not everybody yells. I thought, those wimpy guys. <laughs> I did actually think that. I go, that was a revelation to me. They don't yell. They don't raise their voice. They're like monotone. Like, son, I'm disappointed that happened. My car's destroyed. The dog tore up the seats. There's alcohol all over the back. I can't believe this happened. That wouldn't be my normal instinctive reaction. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm righteous. I'm saying he did it wrong. You understand? Mistakes pastor can't make, right? So I remember that day I looked him right in the eyes with my kid. And then I said this. I will never yell at you again. And I haven't. This has been at least a decade, hasn't it? I never yelled again. I'll yell in the sermons, but I never yelled in discipline. <laughs> never yelled in discipline again. Linda, we left, and she looks at me. How in the world are you going to keep that promise? I said, it's easy. Every time I'm tempted to yell, I'm going to go wash my car. Because I understood habits, at least. And you need a trigger for a habit. The trigger is I want to yell. Instead of yelling, I'm going to change how the trigger works. Instead of triggering yelling, it's going to trigger a clean car, because... God knows how bad my car needs to be bathed. For about a two-year period, I had the cleanest car in town. <laughs> it was unbelievable, spotless clean. Until I had learned a whole new way of relating. And then I was able to be even more consistent in the discipline. Because it was the yelling that caused him to shut down, which caused him to not to hear the message itself. Whereas when I grew up, if my dad wasn't yelling, I didn't think he was serious. Does that make sense? So that was my failure. I didn't adopt my style of uh, disciplining my child in a manner that would reach their heart. And that was a shortcoming of mine. So my discipline became un inconsistent because I wasn't being effective in doing it the right way. So I'm, that, that, that making sense? So I'm going to leave you with this first principle then. There's five of these. Here's the first. Great dads are consistent in the discipline of their children because they are more concerned about the well-being of their child than they are concerned about being liked by their children or venting their own frustration. Amen? Number two, second mistake I made. You feeling better, dads? See, I knew you would feel better as I look bad, right? <laughs> so you can just say to your wife, Pastor your kid's not perfect. You just, I'm not that bad. I mean, I've done less than that. You've got a way out now. Uh, I failed to sufficiently emphasize the law of sowing and reaping. Okay? The law of sowing and reaping in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. In other words, God made this law universal in the universe, and there's no breaking of the law. You can't get around this law. And I needed to emphasize that more, I would say, in our child rearing, because we live in an age where irresponsible conduct is rampant. And everybody makes excuses for their failings and shortcomings. And that's a battle that we have to strap on and consistently pursue. Look at Job chapter 8. You're going to see this is throughout the Bible. Job chapter 4, verse 8 says this, As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Things aren't going well. What have you been plowing? What have you been sowing? Because you're going to reap the same. Hosea 10, 12 to 13. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Steadfast love is, is loyal love that is tempered by grace, mercy, and generosity. Very important word. Break up your follow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. So he's saying like a, like a farmer plows the dirt and plants the seed, plow your heart, open it up so it's receptive, then plant the seeds of righteousness so that God can bring blessing into your life. That's what he's saying. Because the principle of sowing and reaping works in both ways, good and bad, right? Verse 13, you have plowed iniquity, you have reaped injustice, you have eaten the fruit of lies. Because why? Because you trusted in your own way. Reason number one you get in trouble is because you put confidence in your own knowledge, in your own way, your own abilities, rather than what God says. I know better. Or, modern Christianity, God on my terms. Not God on God's terms. And he said, that's how you guys are behaving. And so you're planting the wrong seeds. So you're going to reap some big problems. And so the, the Father God is warning his children. Right? 
because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors. In other words, your own strength. So you're wiser than God and you're more powerful than God. You're going to run your life without God. God is going to be subordinate to you. And God says, watch what you reap from that. That is a, a, a reaping of colossal misery is what you're going to have. And so you see that this law works both ways. That's what I want you to see. It works both ways. And then based on that, there are three practical implications about sowing and reaping that are important for our children to understand. Number one, you are not a victim. Look, kid, you're not a victim. If things are not working out, you are likely experiencing the byproduct of unwise decisions that you made. That's what you, you were planting bad seeds. Now they're all coming in. The harvest is coming. And that's what you've been planting. You've been planting it at, at, at night when everyone's sleeping and no one knows what's going on. But guess what? The harvest comes in the daylight. And we all see what happened. What you've been up to comes out eventually. Does that make sense? Sometimes... This experience is a result of the pain you suffered unjustly. But pain is not an excuse to play the victim. We've all been treated unjustly at some point in time in our life. The question isn't, do we roll over onto our back and just give up and say, I'm just a victim and there's nothing I can do? Or do we say, no, there's a law out there that I can utilize to my advantage. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. And I'm going to be sowing some seeds that will make a different outcome. I'm not going to stay here a victim. Second, so here's the principle. A child needs to understand that the life that they're experiencing now is the direct consequences of their previous attitudes, decisions, and behaviors. They are not victims. They are the authors of their own life story. Now, many of you know that one of the founding elders at the church, a very elderly man, he's like piano keys, 88 plus, he said that when he was six years old, he came to his dad, and he just had this miserable look on his face, and his, his dad was an executive for the Edison Company. And he said, it looks like you're having a bad day, Clark. His name was Clark. And Clark's going, oh, I'm having a bad day. It's a terrible day, you know, doing that thing. So his dad took him into the bathroom and had him stand on the toilet seat with the seat down so he could see himself in the mirror. And he goes, I want you to look in the mirror. And he's looking in the mirror, and he's going to kind of get tears in his eyes. And he goes, Clark? And he goes, yeah, Dad. And he goes, I want you to meet the author of a bad day. <laughs> there it is. You're not a victim, Clark. You're the author of the mess you're in. Six years old. He's 88 today. He still has been shaped by that one moment. That's powerful. Because the message is you're not a victim. You're the author of your own experiences. Number two. Number two. You will never succeed beyond the level of your excuse making. The better you get at making excuses, the less you will succeed in life. Why? An excuse is just a self-manufactured lie that you use to relieve yourself of the pain caused by your own failure. Then, because you do not face the pain of your failure, you remain unmotivated to make the necessary changes that pain demands of you. That's why excuses are so bad. It's a self-reinforcing cycle. You keep running away from the very thing you need to face in order to overcome the problem. You, 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 you fail to see that pain is a gift. It's good. Remember, discipline is good. Pain is good because it teaches you to avoid certain things and practice other things. But when you make excuses, you take yourself out of that feedback loop. So here's the point. Stop making excuses and start planting the seeds of difficult change that will result in a fruit, fruitful future. That's what you do. Stop the excuses. One of my younger brothers left, uh, my, my parents had moved to Washington and all, and I had stayed down here and gone to school, got married and all, and he came down and he wanted to start his life afresh and new, really smart guy, good kid, and uh, he came to live with Linda and I. Eventually, my whole, all my siblings did because uh, my parents got divorced and then my dad died and my dad got the kids, so that means I inherited them. And uh, so we had all these guys live with us. But anyways, this guy, everything he would do, super smart guy, I mean, really, really, really smart. And, but everything, oh, you know, I just can't. He just, it, excuse after excuse after, I'd say, why don't you do that? I want you to give me a different reason. He would give me a list of reasons for everything I suggested he would do. And I finally looked at him and I said, hey, Mark. What? I go, I'm going to give you, I'm going to change your name. He goes, why? I said, I want a more fitting name. And he goes, okay, what are you thinking? I said, Mr. Excuse. We're going to make you Mr. Excuse. And he said, What? I said, you have an excuse for everything. 
Every single thing, you're like the world's classic victim everywhere you go. It's not your fault. And things aren't working out. And so, he, he, like I said, he's a good kid. He goes, I will never make an excuse again. He had one semester of junior college in. I introduced him to a friend of mine that owned a huge business in Newport. He started as a floor sweeper and became, within five years, the CEO of the company. He never made an excuse again. Excuses just destroy your life. They cement you into perpetual failure. Why? It denies the truth of God that you reap what you sow. If you make an excuse, you say that law doesn't really work, God's wrong, and I'm running the universe my way. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And that leads to number three. No human being or circumstance has more control over your future success than you do. Nothing outside of God. So prayerfully plant seeds that will produce the harvest that you want to reap in your future. And the key is this. You can change your tomorrow by changing what you plant today. If you don't like how life is today, what are the seeds you're planting so that tomorrow, in the future, you'll have a better life? Well, I'm not doing anything. Well, then you're going to get more of the same. You have to. I'm, I'm preaching to the kids now, not the dads. Dads, this is what you want to teach them. This is what I wanted to underscore more seriously with my own kids. Because they lose hope so easily in this world that is so filled with negative messages everywhere you look. And all the junk they learn in school that's just a d denial of reality. Like a boy isn't really a good boy. He can be a girl if he likes. Well, that'll screw a kid's head up. You gotta, there's got to be some boundaries and things that you can build your life on. And these are the absolute truths and principles of God's word. You, your success is in your own control. You have to plant the seeds that will lead to success. So what is it that you want to see in your life tomorrow? Then you have to select the proper seed, plant it, water it, nourish it, and watch it come to growth in the right time. So the principle is this, number two, second principle. Great fathers teach their children that there's no such thing as a free lunch. For every action, there's an equal and corresponding reaction. The seed I plant will bring me a harvest. I don't get to pick the harvest. I only get to pick and plant the seed. I don't get to pick the harvest. I can plant and pick the seed. And the seed will determine my harvest. So get in the habit of planting good seeds so that your harvest good fruit for a lifetime. You say, well, where would I start? A, a couple of things that I would say that would be helpful here for those who want to know where to start. In Joshua chapter 1, God tells the people of Israel, if you abide by the principles of my covenant, you will make your life a success. Who will make your life success? You will. Because you'll be planting the right seeds and you'll be reaping the right rewards. So start obeying God's law. Well, where would I start to look? The book of Proverbs. I tell my kids all along, if you don't know what to do, here's one thing you could do. Open your Bible to the book of Proverbs, read, about, read a few of them, and think about those. And you'll be wiser and smarter than everybody else around. And if you do that, you're going to see a lot of success in your life. And that's a simple place to start because it's filled with principles that will make you wise and successful. It even says that in the first chapter. That is God's gift to us in the Bible, to learn how to be successful. Those are all the seeds that need to be planted. So start reading about them and start planting them, and you'll have success in the future. It's guaranteed because God built these laws into the universe. And then I have a bonus dad tip for you dads. You ready? The best way to teach the law of sowing and reaping is to never, 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 never. Did I say never too many times? Let me say this. Never, ever relieve your child of the natural consequences of their actions the natural not the unnatural or the superimposed or the non-connected consequences but the natural consequences of their own actions never interfere with the laws of nature and nature's god allow them to experience the full force you go, well that's not very merciful it's your lack of self-control your lack of self-discipline that intercedes and wrongly tries to blunt the 
the pain of the natural consequence of their own action. And therefore, they don't really believe in the law of sowing and reaping. They believe in the law of rescue by mom and dad. Make them live the laws of nature. They will respect God more, they'll respect nature more, and they will be more successful in their own life. Never, ever bail them out. You know, I didn't do my homework. Mom, will you write my paper for me? No. What am I going to do? You're going to tell the teacher you didn't think it was important to write. <laughs> That's the natural consequence. It's not some superimposed consequence you put on them. I ate too much chocolate. I mean, Herman. <laughs> One kid, of mine, we're going to go golfing. He goes, I want, a, I, want a quart of, I want a quart of orange juice. You don't want a quart of orange juice, man. That's going to make you puke. There's so much sugar in orange juice, man. You can't drink a... I want a quart of orange juice. All right. 20 minutes later, oh, oh, my stomach hurts so bad. Was it a quart? No, it was a half a gallon. That's what it was, a half a gallon. It was one of those things. He's just, ah! Oh! They go, well, put your head out the window. <laughs> sure enough, we delivered that one. <laughs> There's too much sugar in that. You just got, you just, that's the natural consequence. You have to live. Now, if it was poison, I wouldn't let him do that. I wouldn't let him get into the planting the seed in the first place, right? But I wouldn't try to rescue him. And, and this is the point. You have to let them experience the natural consequences of their own actions. Never, ever interfere. Always make them live with the results of their decisions. Okay? Number three. I got five failures. Here's the third. I was not involved enough in their education. And I was on the, for my time, I'm 62, going to be 63 shortly, right? When my kids were going through this stuff, I was on the cutting edge of homeschooling stuff. I was looked at as the wild man, the crackpot, the weird guy. I got my undergrad degree in Christian education. Then my master's in theology, etc. So I understood the educational process. I wish I had taken it more seriously than I did 30 years ago. And now... It's 10 times more serious than it was 30 years ago. This is a huge, huge issue. In fact, look what the Bible says here. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. The principle is simply this. Great fathers understand it is their responsibility to educate their children. Remember, fathers bring up the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we saw in Ephesians chapter 6. Mom helps out. Dad needs to take the leadership. Great fathers understand it's their responsibility to educate the children, not the government schools, not the private school, not the church. All these things can be tools that you can use to help educate your children, but the ultimate responsibility for the education of the child's mind, heart, and spirit lies on the shoulders of dad and mom. And since dad is the spiritual leader in the home, he is primarily responsible before God. You want to be the leader? You are the leader. You're going to give an account for your leadership. And this applies to the discipline and the instruction of your children in the home. Mom's there to help. Help me. Come alongside. Your job is to lead out. And well, how do you do that? By being a servant leader. And we're going to talk about how to do that in, later in this message. I want to read to you from a book that came, was published this week, released this week. I promise you it'll be the most important book you read this year and maybe in the next decade. It's called The Battle for the American Mind, written by a guy who graduated from Princeton and from Harvard who is a Christian. And he gives you some powerful truths about education in America today. This is what he says. For many, many years, my fear concerned higher education but it has become clearer and clearer that the real problem is high school, middle school, and now elementary school. The battlefield for the hearts and minds and souls of our kids is the 16,000 hours they spend inside American classrooms from kindergarten. Why do we have a German name for kindergarten? Well, if you go back in the history, what she does in the book is it became from the German Marxists who wanted to put a garden to grow Marxist children, kindergarten. Oh, yeah. Fascinating stuff in this book. Am I getting a little upset? I haven't even got wound up yet. You're not yelling yet. I'm not yelling yet? Okay, good. They just turn it down back there so I don't look so red-faced, right? 
Uh, he says, so the battlefield for the hearts and minds and souls of our kid is the 16,000 hours they spend inside American classrooms from kindergarten to 12th grade. It's the 16,000 hours of war for our children and for our country through a seemingly unstoppable progressive pri- pipeline. Teachers' union priorities, teachers' colleges, common core prerogatives, unchecked teachers and administrators. The woke social justice agenda is showing up in the youngest of classrooms. Often the books and curricula are hidden from the parents. Today, the gender unicorn and the ubiquitous concepts like it across the country normalize the concepts of gender identity being completely separate from sex assigned at birth. They encourage kids to grapple with physical and emotional attraction, especially towards the same sex. This is not scientific. There is only one right answer for them, and that is that biology doesn't matter. In elementary school, it's sheer indoctrination for 16,000 hours. It's nearly impossible without really digging to find books that contain patriotic, Christian, or conservative themes. What place do traditional biblical values or patriotic celebration have in these institutions? I'll answer you, not much. Instead, these institutions and associated platforms use targeted temptation to lure young kids away from God, away from traditional Christian values, and and away from the love of country. The point is, we are culturally surrounded. The classroom, literature, movies, music, Television, social media are all full-blown avenues of attack from the leftist Marxists. How do parents fight back? Well, considering my own winding personal path, one hour on Sunday morning and one hour on Wednesday night at youth group is not enough, not even close. And that was back in the 1990s and the 2000s before social media and smartphones. It has been that politics is downstream from culture, meaning that politics is a lagging indicator Things change in our politics because our culture has already changed. In this way, representative politics in America is a reflection of the culture we cultivate as Americans. Our current culture was not created in a vacuum. It is grounded in faith, faith in something. For hundreds of years, including our own founding revolution, as we fought a civil war to end the sin of slavery, the single most important ingredient in our culture was in our Judeo-Christian faith and traditions. We knew the Bible. We understood the Western tradition. We appreciated America's special place on the historical continuum. Collectively, we have lost all of that, or almost all of that. There are many empty church pews combined with secular classrooms which have intentionally bred a sheer anti-American, anti-Western, anti-Christian culture that is now just revealing itself. Not only do we have our Christian faith, excuse me, not only do we not have our Christian faith, but we now don't even have faith in America. Fighting for the former, the Christian faith, without fortifying the latter, America is a losing proposition because cultures like classrooms and politics always believe in something. What in the world do we believe in today? What is our religion? This book that we write is not simply about dismantling government schools or trashing elite schools. It is about you. It is about your kids, your grandkids, my kids, my future grandkids. Ultimately, their future is only one set of hands, ours. Knowing what you know, seeing what you are seeing, feeling what you are feeling, what will you do about it? Will we make excuses for ourselves and think that we can fix government schools? Will we pretend that somehow our government or private school is actually not captured by cultural Marxists? Will we retreat to Christian or Catholic schools who sprinkle faith on top of an otherwise progressive education? Will we spend our money on vacations and cars and the latest gadgets, but not on the best possible education of our most precious gifts? If as parents we believe our most important charge on planet Earth, the legacy that we will leave is the children we raise, then what risk would we not take? What sacrifice will we not make? What change would we not endure to forge Christian faith-filled, and patriotic 
children. Amen. I have good news for you to accompany the discouraging moment there. He gives an antidote in the book. I'm excited about the antidote because, like I said, he's a highly educated guy at the finest schools in America, went into the military, was in the intelligence oper operations, highly respected guy, really smart. He did all the research for this book, and he came to the conclusion there's one way to turn this around. It's not to fix the schools. You ready for this? It's to provide an alternative by starting classical Christian education. Amen. That's what we did a year ago. He came across the same information I came across a year ago when I said we want to start a new school here at this church, a homeschooling system that's a whole new paradigm that allows it to be homeschooled so we don't have government regulation, but it's also instructing in classical Christian education. That if you can get 5% of the population to buy into that, you can transform culture. That's what the Marxists decided about 100 years ago. We can use the same play against them now. It starts with classical Christian education. Not a normal Christian school. Normal Christian schools are using the same philosophical approaches to education that the Marxists are, so those things make them vulnerable to the influence of Marxists and culture. It has to be classical Christian education. And those are the ones that all the studies show, the kids that raised in classical Christian education, over 95 plus percent of them continue on in their personal devotions when they graduate from high school, whereas from a normal Christian school, it's about 50%, and from a regular school, it's less than 10%. There is a dramatic change because it is what? It's following the Judeo-Christian educational system laid out by the Bible. This is what you want to expose your kids to and your grandkids to. Now, guess who was on the cutting edge of this? I'd like to say I was. I started a year ago, but I'm really not. John MacArthur, he's mentioned in the book. R.C. Sproul, who's mentioned in the book. These guys saw it a few decades ago and decided to build classical Christian education institutions. And if you want to know what's the best Christian school to send your kids to locally, Masters, not Biola. I went to Biola. I went to Biola Graduate School. You don't want to put your kid in there. I mean, I follow. I'm an alumnus. I don't like what they're doing. You sure don't want to go to Westmont's twice as much and twice as bad. You want to send them over there to the Masters College where they learn classical Christian approach. Their Old Testament scholars are some of the best in the world. Solid, rock-solid Christian guys, man. I love reading their commentaries. These are really fine guys. They took the best guys from Biola when I was there, and MacArthur recruited them to his school because Biola was already kind of leaking oil at those days. And so he said, hey, we're going to do something different. You want to join me? And he took, like, the top guys. It happened when I was there. This is the way forward. This is why we're going to put more energy into our homeschool project. Because it's classical Christian education, and I am so happy that we have Allie, who is probably the greatest, most, the smartest person around who understands that form of education. Super excited about doing that at our church. So, what, do I, what am I saying here besides a, a, making an advertisement for our school? <laughs> Buy that book. Read this book. Be educated in this book. Learn something great that you can do for your kids, grandkids, and future generations. The American Mind by Pete Hegseth. Really great book. Now, here's the key. If you've entrusted the education of your children to the public or even private school system, then you need to know exactly what their, ch what their children are being taught and not taught. Then prayerfully ask yourself these questions. If you're going to say, I'm, I'm not worried about the school. Okay, here's some questions you should ask. Is this what my kids are learning consistent with what I want my child to know, believe, embrace, and live out? is what they're teaching. They teach evolution. Do you want your kid to believe evolution? What are you going to do to stop it? I told my kids in high school, in junior high, tell your science teacher, I'll come in and I'll debate them on evolution and I won't use any Bible, I'll only use science. They all refused me repeatedly. Every year I asked and every year said no. <laughs> what do you think that means? It means they know they don't have the truth on their side. They're in indoctrination camps. As one guy said, I think he's really great, the local school system is Satan's youth group. And he's right. And when you read this book, 
you're going to go, I think he's right. It doesn't mean every teacher in there is an evil person by any stretch. We've got people who are teaching in the public school system in our church, and they're doing what? They keep their head down, and they keep insinuating the truth in nice ways. That's called working on the inside as a fifth pillar. Good, more, more power to them. Let's pray for them, encourage them. But my kid doesn't need to be uh, in the mix. I'm going to take responsibility to educate my kid in a way that knows, loves, and obeys God who's revealed himself in the Bible with a classical Christian education, which was the foundation of our own country. And because it has been stolen from us, beginning in about 1918 and executing a century-long plan to steal it from the Christian influence and turn it into an atheistic, godless society. They didn't understand that that meant Marxist society. They just wanted it godless. And that's what you get. You either get Marxism or you get God. You don't get both. It's impossible. All right, enough said. Another question to ask is, uh, will this advance my child's spiritual, emotional, intellectual health and growth? And do I even want my child around this person, the teacher? Have you met the teacher? Talked to the teacher? Learned about their personal life? Is that the person you want spending all day with your child? Those are things to ask. I mean, you, you want them to babysit your kid because they're effectively doing that and more. You should at least vet them. Number four, the fourth thing I said, I have five failures. You excited about the f three so far? All right, these will go a little faster. <laughs> I don't want this to be a multi-sermon. Number four, I was too lenient in guarding them from unhealthy friendships. 1 Corinthians 15, says this, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. I did two things wrong. Number one, I underestimated the amount of damage my child's friends who did not share our faith and values could inflict upon the spiritual life and values of our children. We, I asked Linda before I uh, finalized the sermon notes, how many kids, street rats, we would call them, would came and lived with us? <laughs> Because their parents would kick them out or they did, or parents got separated no one wanted them. And they were, our kids knew about them at school. And, we, you know, we're a strong Christian family. We're going to take them in under our wing. We're going to help them find Jesus. This is going to be a great deal. We're idealistic and thinking it's a smart idea. Wrong. How many, Linda, did we say 10? At least 10 kids over the time period? I don't know if any are still walking with the Lord, do you? No, not a good idea. Point being made. Not a good idea. Well intended. Bad idea. Why? I violated the Bible. Bad company corrupts good morals. They just taught our kids how to scheme better. The road is normally downhill for fools. And children, when they're born, are fools. They have to be trained in wisdom and righteousness. So if you leave it to the fellow pirates, it gets worse. It doesn't mean our kids are all bad, but my point is it had a very negative effect had a very negative effect. So that was our first mistake. And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians 6, don't continue to team up with unbelievers and mismatched alliances. For what partnership is there between righteousness and rebellion? Who could mingle light with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? Or does a believer have, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? First mistake, I, un, I overestimated or I should say underestimated the amount of damage a child can do that doesn't love the Lord in influencing your child. Secondly, I overestimated my ability to manage their involvement with other kids who don't share our values or <coughs> beliefs. I thought, well, come on, I'm a pastor. I can handle it. I mean, this guy's like 10 years old. Well, he's no challenge. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Let's have him live with us. Bad idea. Bad idea. The antidote is believe God's word and protect your children. We aren't as sharp as we think we are. Now, if you're called to do this as a ministry, wait till your kids are grown and, and, and move on and then open a house to, to, to recover these kids. I'm, I'm all in favor of it. I still have a heart for that. I care about that. But I would not do it over with my own kids in the developmental phase. No way. Not going to work. They're not strong enough. <sighs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I always remind myself, Kent, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on Kent's own understanding. Seek his will. Do all you do, and he will show which path to take. That's the truth. Principle, great dads protect their children from harmful friendships while they instill in their children the conviction that we always take on 
the thinking patterns, the attitudes, the values, the behaviors, and the character of the people we spend our time with. So, so be around the kind of people you want to become. That's the lesson. Surround yourself with people who share your values. And that's, that's why we have a church. We surround ourselves with people who share our values, share our beliefs, share our traditions, share our ambitions, because we're trying to support and encourage one another to do the right thing. And number five, I said there's five, here it is. I spent too much time as a level one leader. I'm a spiritual leader in my home. I spent too much time as a level one leader with my kid. What does this mean? A level one leader is a command and control leader. They say things like this. I tell you what to do and you do it because I am dad. That makes me the boss. Ever say that? Why do I have to do that, dad? Because I said so. Ever do that? Anyone ever do that? Don't raise your hand too high. <laughs> now, I said too long. In other words, it's an appropriate starting place of leadership, but it's not. You want to get off that level as soon as you possibly can. You don't want to be telling your kid, because I said so. Your wife says, could I? No, I can't. Why? Why can't we do that? Because I said so. This is just not someone you want to live with, is it? And it's a very unpleasant kind of spiritual leader. It's anything but a servant leader, that's for sure. In other words, your kid follows you because he has to. But as soon as he no longer has to follow you, guess what? He won't. <laughs> this kind of leadership is where your influence starts with your child, but it needs to last for a very short period of time. Because if you stay on this level too long, instead of building respect, you build resentment. There's a better way. And the way is, is to be a servant leader. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Read that passage, and God says that we're called to be servant leaders, that he is to be the leaders to be servant of all. What does that mean? We influence through service rather through power, command, and control. That's the goal. We want to lead our family, lead our children through a heart of service instead of command, control, and power. Whenever you have to resort to power, you're not leading anymore as a servant leader. Well, I won't give you any money then. Or I'm going to do this or that. I'll punish you this way. All these kind of power plays are the last thing that you want to do to build a healthy leadership. And if you stay on that level one position, you're going to suffer for it. So I'm going to go through the five levels real quick and we'll wrap it up. Level one position is this. Child follows because they have to. The father teaches the child God's order of submission to authority. That's the goal. Once they understand that God has established submission to authority, they're ready to move on to level two leadership. Okay? Dad models healthy submission in his own interactions by saying this, how can I help you, son? How can I help you, sweetheart? How can I help you? That's how you influence, by being a servant leader on a level one leader through a position. Level one leadership starts. How can I help you? And once you establish level one and the relationship's functioning correctly, then you go to level two. You don't stop doing level one. That was a big mistake I made. That was the second big mistake I made on this. I thought, oh, I got that behind me, and now let's go to level two. I'm not helping you anymore. Well, that wasn't smart. Level two is personality. The child follows you because he likes and respects you. The father teaches the child how to love others with God's kind of love. Dad models authentic love by taking interest in the child, by spending time with the child, and asking questions of the child, chiefly about their interests, their feelings, and their concerns. Dad models this habit of level two personality leadership by saying things like, hey, tell me about. Hey, how did that make you feel? Hey. What's going on over there? It looks like you and your friends are, are having a little tension. Hey, anything I could do to help you in this? These asking questions that cause them to open their heart, that's level two influence. That creates a bond of, of mutual love and respect for one another. And the child sees the father as a resource that they can go to to talk about the issues they're confronted with. Here's how you, you kill level two leadership. You start giving unsolicited advice. You start telling them and lecturing them. And then make the lecture real long. And then repeat yourself in the lecture. And make it as boring as you possibly can. And then when you're all done and their eyes have glazed over, walk out and do something else. Just so they know, talking to dad is one of the most miserable experiences that's known to man. Because he talks, you listen, and then you want to just fall asleep. 
That's how you kill level two. You want to open them up, not shut them down. Stop talking. I, I, I thought of this anac a acronym. acronym. This, I found this acronym last week, and I thought, this is beautiful. I'm going to put it on, the, on all my notepads, and I have been this week. You know what it says? Wait. You know what that stands for? Why am I talking? <laughs> Such a great reminder. Just wait, Kent. Why am I talking? I want to hear from them. I really do. Shut up. You already talk too much. This is, you know what? This is my fifth sermon this week. Sixth, if you encounter a wedding. And I got two more to go. I have plenty to say. I don't need to keep talking. Look at you're already nine minutes late. Shame on you. You're such slow learners. I could have had this done. No, I'm kidding. You'll have to pardon me for these. We got two more to go. Level three, right? Level three, four, and five. Those are the three we have left. The productivity. Child follows you because when he does, he succeeds. He wins when he does it God's way. Dad's way. God's way. You, can't get, you don't distinguish between you and God. He succeeds because he does it God's way. The father teaches the child how to succeed in life primarily by ordering one's life according to the wisdom of God found in God's word and through prayer, seeking God's wisdom, will, and strength. So that's what you're trying to do. You show them how to win. They see that you're a winner. They want to win too, and they want to win with you. And when you win with them, your credibility goes up, your influence rises, you're leading them better. Is that making sense? And what are you doing? You're showing them that the way we win is ordering our life according to the principles of God's word because those are the seeds that produce a harvest of success. God promised that. That's why he gave us his law for that purpose, right? Dad is constantly projecting the attitude, what does God's word say about this problem? Or let's seek God's wisdom and will in this matter. God does this mostly through regular spontaneous prayer together. Hey, let's stop and just pray about it. This is a problem. Let's pray about it right now. That kind of stuff, right? And applying together the biblical principles of success that are found in the book of Proverbs. Well, I wonder what God's word says about this. Let's just dig into that and see what he says. Maybe this is something we could do. And when you start getting some victories, you get some credibility, your leadership has gone to, to level three, and now you're ready for level four leadership. And this is personal impact. The child follows dad and seeks your counsel because he has experienced the positive impact you have had on his personal life. So look at the deal. Level one, he follows you because he has to. That's called positional leadership, worst kind. Take off the badge that says, I'm dad, I'm the boss. Forget all that. Say, how can I help you? Level two says personality. I actually like my dad. He's a nice guy. I enjoy him. He actually asks me questions. He's interested in my life. He doesn't just lecture me all the time. He actually cares about me and the stupid stuff that I do. This is personality and personal relationship. That's level two leadership. Level three leadership is, man, my dad knows how to win. That guy has got the Midas touch. When he helps me with stuff, I get A's on my school projects. When he helps me with my friends and the fights we have, we end up winning the fight. Everything that I do with my dad, we win. I like winning. I like being on my dad's team. That's easy. Level four is, holy cow, he wasn't just lucky. He's got a string of wins. We are winning so much, we're getting tired of winning, as a famous president once said. That's going to be their attitude, though. We're winning. When we go with Dad, things win. Man, this is great. And, God, and Dad says it's because he's following God. See how we're moving this thing in the right direction? It's personal impact. And so what ends up happening? He experienced the positive impact you've had in his personal life as well as on his social relationships outside the home. Dad leads his child not by lecturing or being the quick answer man, but by asking sincere questions that foster collaboration. Now the questions are, what do you think we should do, son? If you were going to handle this problem, what would you do? Or maybe you even talk to him about a problem you have at work and say, hey, i got a problem at work. I'd like to get your thoughts, son. I'd like to get your thoughts, sweetheart. And talk about it with them. Let them have a voice in your life. They respect you enough to voice it. You're building this relationship. And you, it's all about collaboration. And they get... and, and they ask, so you ask questions to get to the heart of the issue at hand. On level four, dad leads and influences the child primarily by helping the child discover the answers for themselves through collaboration. You're trying to teach them how to collaborate to get answers and get the right kind of answers they need. And this is important. I underline this in my notes. Dad does not offer advice unless asked. 
Do you want my opinion on that? They say, well, I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> Have enough humility to say, okay, fine. Well, if you ever do, let me know. Don't take it personally and go, you know, cry in the corner. Just go, well, he wants to take a shot. Well, we'll see if he's right. And either way, I'm on his team. I'll pray for his success, right? But don't lecture unless you're asked for your advice. And guess what? If you don't overtalk, they'll probably ask your advice. And then level five is personhood. The child follows you, reveres you, loves you, respects you because you've done one through four so well for so long with so much integrity, love, and honesty that God becomes a living legend to them and a treasured part of the family. You understand that? You know what the bad news? Not many men reach this level of spiritual leadership and influence in their family. And those who do usually don't live to hear about it. They don't need to because they know it in their gut. But, and this is from a pastor of over 37 years, at dad's funeral, there are many tears, moving stories, and words of great respect, affection, and painful loss without dad. And those are rare funerals that I've conducted. But when it's true, those men had left a ginormous impact on their family, on their children, their grandchildren, and sometimes their great-grandchildren, their friends, their co-workers, and everybody that knew them because they were level five legendary kind of leaders. And they don't need the public affirmation because they know they have that influence. They walk in the room and everybody goes, whatever he's doing, I'm doing too. And he doesn't have to say anything but just be himself. And I'll add this thing. You'll know you're on level five when you know that you are just being yourself and you don't care what anybody else thinks, but you notice they all follow. Because there's, a, you know, there's the clown that doesn't care what anyone thinks and they're all mocking him. And we're talking about the guy that actually has enough maturity, enough self-confidence, enough uh, security in his own person that he says, well, if you don't like me, that's fine. I'm good. I'm good. I know what I'm doing. I'm where I'm going. I'm what I know what I'm about. And that guy makes a difference in the world. The principle, great fathers understand and practice the five levels of leadership for their children. Final thoughts. In spite of all the shortcomings and my failings, I was able to get one thing right. Just one thing. As a father, I modeled a heart for God. And in spite of all the mistakes that I made, I can honestly say my children all love God today. Because you have to do one thing and only one thing. And that is personally cultivate a heart that loves, obeys, and knows God who's revealed himself in the Bible. Live it authentically every day in your personal life. And people who know you, your family, your children, will follow your God because you really believe it. Period. No compromise. You don't have to be perfect. That's one of our values here. We don't expect you to be perfect. We just expect you to have integrity. Admit it when you're wrong, but pursue God with all of your heart, and God will bless that. And in spite of all the mistakes, God's grace will be enough to get your family through. I hope you're encouraged by that. I hope you've learned from my mistakes. I hope that you find encouragement to model for your children and grandchildren how to know, love, and obey God, which is the most important thing anyways. But not the only thing, but the most important thing. So that you can do and be the father God wants you to be and do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word and for the encouragement that uh, your word teaches us. And I thank you, Lord, for these mistakes that I've made. Because by reflecting on them, thinking about them, uh, I've helped myself grow. And I hope it's helped your people grow. Lord, I pray that as I normally do, that... Anything that I've said in this message that's not really from you and is only in my flesh, I pray they'll forget it, they won't remember it, they'll make fun of it or something like that, but they won't take it to heart. But those things that are truly anointed by you and, and selected by your spirit for our growth and benefit and for your glory, I pray that you would cause to just take root in our heart. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.